Uh, good morning. And I stand in solidarity uh, with the Archons who have heeded the call of His Holiness, All Holiness, Bartholomew, uh, Archbishop Demetrius, and uh, of course, on the leadership of Dr. Limarakis and the guidance of my friend, Father Alex. You know, we take freedom for granted. And when we get up early in the morning, first thing we need to do is say, thank God for another day. Thank God that we can rise, we can see, we can hear, we can walk, we can appreciate the blessings that God has given us. And what a blessing to be in the United States, the land of freedom. Someone who experienced and suffered persecution appreciates more than those who were born in freedom. And Senator, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, yes, I experienced the beast in humanity, the worst. But I have not given up faith in God, not given up faith in man. There were heroes, men and women, who sacrificed their lives in order to save other human beings. I'd like to, uh, although it's a Republican administration, I'd like to qu uh, quote President Roosevelt. Very appropriate. Four freedoms. Freedom of speech. Freedom of worship. Freedom from what? And freedom from fear. Thank God. In our blessed land, we have freedom of speech. We have freedom of worship, unlike the Christians. Over one and a half million dislodged, persecuted in the uh, Middle East, Iraq, Syria, the Rohingya, the Anamar. Pope Francis just visited. We have freedom of speech, we have freedom of worship. Freedom from want. Thank God we have plenty of food. Prosperity. Although when we eat, we have to remember the millions who don't have pure water to drink. We have no food to eat. Let's not take that for granted. But what we don't have, particularly since 9-11, is the fear of terrorism. Here in Europe, in Asia, throughout the world, the scourge of terrorism. That's a fear. And it's particularly painful, and with this I conclude, when I say the representatives of the Coptic Church here, men and women and children, go to church to pray and are not sure whether they're going to come home safely because those beasts, terrorists, hit the jugular vein of every faith community, churches, temples, synagogues, mosques, and claiming the lives of innocent human beings. So may God give us the strength to do his work. You know, we petition God every day with a wish list. God also has a wish list to us. He wants us to be co-partners with him in building a better world. 
And so I pray that God should give you the wisdom to be in partnership with the Almighty. And in turn, may he bless you and your families and reward your commitment uh, to the church, to his all holiness, to the Archbishop Demetrius, and together. Don't give up hope. My favorite psalm is the 180th psalm. And the same in Amit Sakarati from the Abbas, God, I called upon you. You answered my prayers. And I'll tell you my prescription that each one of you can use too. I don't know, I leave Eloira. God is with me. I am not afraid. Say it with me. God is with me. I am not afraid. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi Schneier. Today is the feast day of St. Nicholas, a great saint of Christianity. And I invite to the podium His Eminence Archbishop Demetrius and his deacons to offer the Torparion. after listening to our beloved friend Rabbi Schneider, we are going to chant the Apolitikion, which is a main hymn on the occasion of the Feast of St. Nicholas. Uh, this is not only because St. Nicholas is an important saint in the church, but also because St. Nicholas has a particular connection with us. Uh, we have the church to be built at this moment at Ground Zero, where it was hit during September 11, and therefore this is exactly in honor also of rebuilding not only a church, but hope and future. And we have the Deacon from the Archdiocese and Nectarius, the chief cantor of our cathedral in New York. Please, come closer to translation of what we chanted. It's the hymn addressed to St. Nicholas. You were revealed to your flock as a measure of faith. You were the image of humility and a teacher of self-control. Because of your humble life, heaven was open to you. Because of your poverty, spiritual riches were granted to you, O Holy Bishop Nicholas. We cry out to you, pray to Christ our God that our souls may be saved.
Please be seated. At this time, it's a great honor and with great pride, I invite to the podium brother Archon Heftaxius, Michael Carluzzo's beloved son of Father Alex and Presbytera, who will introduce our keynote speaker, Senator Marco Rubio. Good morning, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm not going to make this a long introduction. We all saw the senator walk into the room. He has a very tight schedule. I'm going to invite Senator Rubio to the podium at this point to address the brothers and sisters here. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you. You can't make it a long introduction. I'm only 46 years old. You know? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, but I, um, I, I want to thank you for having me here today. It's, a, it's an honor and a, and a privilege and a blessing to be able to speak to you on this important moment, moment in this important place. And on this important topic, I have, of course, the privilege of representing a very vibrant uh, Orthodox community in, in my home state of Florida. And I'd like to thank His Eminence, the Archbishop Demetrios, for your leadership and the Order of St. Andrew for convening really this critical gathering on a topic that is both timely and urgent. And I'm honored to be here this morning with so many distinguished religious leaders and advocates who are working on behalf of this extraordinary cause. So the issue of uh, religious freedom is a uh, deeply personal to me as it is for so many of you. It's something I've dedicated much of my time advancing since uh, my first joining the United States Senate. Within the realm of, of religious freedom, the persecution of Christians in the Middle East, the focus of this year's conference has reached historic proportions and dangerous proportions. It begins by remembering that religious freedom is actually at the center of America's own experiment in self-governance and our very founding, our earliest documents our founding documents were more spiritual documents than they were political ones. They, uh, they were enshrined on an idea that all men were created equal because our rights come from our creator, not from our king, not from our laws, not even from that constitution, but that our rights come from an all-powerful God who grants every single one of us the right to pursue life and liberty and to pursue happiness. And understanding that that's at the core of who we are as a people. By the way, that was a very revolutionary idea to the people who wrote it. There was nothing to compare it to. Much of the world, to them, that was a crazy idea at the time. Throughout all of human history, people had grown up and lived believing that their rights, to the extent that concept even existed, was whatever the people who were powerful decided to let them have. The idea that somehow our rights were given to us by our creator uh, was revolutionary in more ways than one, and ultimately change the world. I'm a deep believer that our foreign policy should be effused with our deeply held values such as these. Uh, not to impose it on other people, but to, but to ensure that in everything we do, we protect the rights of others to also fulfill their God-given rights. The right of the ability of every man, woman, and child to peacefully worship and live out their faith according to the dictates of their conscience is at the heart of, of human dignity and should animate us both here and abroad. Violations of religious freedom occur daily around the globe at the hands of state and non-state actors alike. No faith and no region is untouched, but the focus today is on the persecution of Christians, which has reached staggering levels. That is our focus. So if we go back to 2015 alone, the International Religious Freedom Advocacy Group, Open Doors, estimates that more than 7,000 Christians, 7,000 Christians died because they were Christians. By the way, this doesn't include the millions more who were attacked or imprisoned or forcibly displaced or otherwise harmed. And unfortunately, as you are all well aware, the Middle East is ground zero for these attacks. It is a testament to the unbreakable ties that Christianity has to the Middle East and to the unshakable faith of our brothers and sisters that they persevere in this region despite this. But the Middle East is more than a place where Christians live. It is also at the center of our narrative as is set forth in the Holy Scripture. As the miracle child who was born in a manger grew to manhood and embarked on his earthly ministry, this God made man, he drew his, together a band of followers and disciples that after his death and resurrection spread throughout the world with no money, no political power, no weapons, no army, and were unlikely purveyors of the good news that now has reached every corner of the globe. The believers, 
who live in Iraq and in Egypt and in Syria and throughout the Middle East can clearly trace their roots, the roots of their faith, to these earliest apostles. A moment ago, we heard from Rabbi Schneer, and we're always honored to be in the presence of leaders uh, in the faith of our older brothers and sisters in the faith, the Jewish people through whom God first revealed his plan for mankind. The Bible's Old Testament, as we call it, is full of references to the ancient cities and towns that comprise what is now modern-day Iraq. Abraham er, hailed from Ur, which is in southern Iraq. Isaac's wife, Rebecca, was from northwest Iraq. The 12 sons of Jacob were all born in what today is modern-day Iraq, and the spiritual revival depicted in the book of Jonah occurred in the city of Nineveh, now known as Mosul, in the headlines quite often over the last five years. Many of our brothers and sisters in this region still speak Aramaic, the language that our Lord spoke, and they traced their faith back to the Apostle Thomas, among others. So a young girl, Mary and Joseph, fled Herod's murderous aims and sought refuge in ancient Egypt. And years later, the Apostle Mark would bring Christianity to Alexandria, considered the father of the Coptic church in Egypt. He was martyred in 68 in the year of our Lord. According to scripture, the Apostle Paul had a divine encounter on the road to Damascus, another city in our headlines. This was the beginning of his ministry that would take him all over the region and beyond sharing the good news. The Apostle Paul later led a mission to Antioch, and tradition holds that Jesus' disciples were first called Christians in that city. Today, the marginalization and even the martyrdom of these same communities suffer, that these same communities are suffering is resonant with the earliest persecutions endure, endured by the followers of our Lord. These realities may have been exacerbated by the rise of ISIS, but sadly, they will not end with the terrorist group's eventual military defeat. Numerically, there has been a sad and precipitous decline in the Christian population throughout the region, and this decline began and predates the existence of ISIS. So according to the Hudson Institute, in 1910, Greater Syria, the Levant, was about 30% Christian. Syria, before the revolution, was 8%. If there is a Syria in the future, I'm quoting from one of their reports, there is no telling what the Christian percentage would be. These numbers tell a similar story in Iraq. A generation ago, there were 1.5 million Christians in Iraq. Today, most estimates are that there are less than 200,000 and more leaving daily. And these numbers have to be put in the context to fully, in context to fully understand the horrific violations against Christians living in these ancient lands. The context tells the story of the body of Christ under assault. Here are just a few examples of the heinous events over the last few years. All of these events I'm sure you're well familiar with. The Palm Sunday attack in Egypt of worshipers where they were targeted with bombs that killed dozens last April. In June, Coptic men, women, and children slaughtered on a bus en route to a monastery. In Syria, priests and nuns that have been kidnapped. In ISIS-held territory, Christian women sold into sexual slavery. In Iraq, Christian homes marked with the red painted noon. Ancient houses of worship converted to weapon storehouses and torture chambers. Thousands of innocent people displaced overnight and are now living in temporary shelters, uncertain what the future holds for them and their families. The full measure of this human suffering exacted against these innocent people of faith remains truly incalculable. As it relates to ISIS atrocities, they have rightly been called genocide by the Obama and Trump administration. But words alone, though important, are hollow unless they are followed by action and we must be moved to action to preserve the very cradle of our faith. ISIS is seeking to erase thousands of years of history and the people and stories that represent it. If the United States fails to take meaningful steps to support these communities, including ensuring their access to humanitarian assistance and the resources they need to rebuild, then even more of them will be forced to abandon their ancient homeland. It would be a tragedy on a multitude of levels and a death blow to the vision of a diverse, pluralistic Middle East that respects religious freedom. It is not only a moral imperative, but also a matter of U.S. national security. The continued presence and even flourishing of these ancient communities and the lands that they have inhabited for millennia, that helps to stabilize and moderate the region, which is why I deeply appreciate the Vice President's personal commitment to this issue including a stated intention to ensure that U.S. humanitarian and reconstructive assistance 
reaches these religious minority communities who have been targeted with genocide. The Vice President has championed this cause within the administration, and later this month, he will travel to the region in part to draw attention to the plight of the persecuted Christians and religious minorities across the Middle East and the broader Arab world. I thank him for his attention to this issue. We should all thank him. And I look forward to continuing to work with him and with his office. Even before this murderous onslaught that we saw from the Islamic State, U.S. assistance to these imperiled communities has lacked adequate oversight and in far too many cases has failed to reach the intended recipients. And so we will continue to press for aid accountability, including ensuring that genocide-targeted communities, among them Christians, are receiving what they need in order to restart and rebuild their lives. The gospel tells, well, not the, the, the first Peter tells us not to be surprised when the fiery, fiery trial comes upon, but rather to rejoice in Christ's suffering. Our Christian brothers and sisters in the Middle East are living this trial. The spirit of the glory of God rests upon them. In February of 2015, that trial was on display on a windswept Libyan beach where ISIS kidnapped and beheaded 21 mostly Coptic Christians. The images of barbarism on display on that day pierced through all the noise of the 24-hour news cycle, and it shocked people of all faiths in the civilized world. But there was a different sort of shock and disbelief that emerged in the days that followed, ones that take us back to our roots as a faith. As more details became known regarding the almost supernatural faith and the courage of these men who refused to deny their faith in the face of certain death. As one Coptic bishop recounted, quote, the name of Jesus was the last words on their lips. They entrusted themselves to the one who would receive them soon after. That name whispered in the last moments was like the seal of their martyrdom, end quote. As we in the West encounter the bold and the unapologetic faith of believers dwelling in lands, dwelling in lands where their identity as Christians make them susceptible to displacement and attack, and persecution, and even death, we can't help but wonder at their courage and steadfastness. We can't help but be inspired by these modern-day cloud of witnesses. They have truly counted the cost of discipleship. They have taken up their cross. They have tread the road to Calvary. By the way, these stories and others link us back to the early Christian church. It's an amazing story. They ultimately overthrew the greatest empire in the history of the world. As I said earlier, they did it without any money, no politics, didn't have an army, didn't have weapons. They did it, not in, by the way they lived. And the pagan world had no chance. If you read the early accounts, particularly at the end of that period before Rome turned to Christianity, it was a society with incredible inequality, Roman society, where there was incredible inequality. Um, there was a lot of wealth concentrated in the hands of a powerful few and then everybody else. Being a widow was certain death, or at least abandonment and suffering. Orphans, which was anyone who lost a father, had a tough life ahead of them for as long as that lasted. And it was a society that valued things like strength, Versus and, and pride against humility and meekness. And then along comes this band of followers taken up, by the way, from all a cross-section of that society in Rome and in Roman Empire. And in this society, the slave and the rich, wealthy Roman were treated equal. In that society, being poor and meek was not a sign of weakness, but an opportunity to serve. In that society, they faced person... In, in that group, uh, the, the uh, weakness was not seen as weakness. In fact, it was seen as a sign of strength. And compassion was seen as a sign and a, and a noble endeavor. And the pagan world didn't understand it. They didn't know how to confront it. And it wasn't so much the words they preached, but the way they lived in the face of this suffering that ultimately ended up converting, converting the vast number of people to join the faith. It was the way they lived their lives and in their bold example, not just in their preaching and in their teaching that Christianity grew and came to overthrow the most powerful empire in the world and replaced it with a set of values that have spread throughout the world. 
And so the lesson to be learned there is that while we believe in our faith and we preach it in our words, we should live it in our life. And despite this terrible suffering that we try and we'll do everything we can to address, let us also remember that we have always been a persecuted church. We don't seek persecution and we don't welcome them, but we were told it was coming. And we were told that as long as we adhere to the teachings of our Lord, there would be those that would hate us and reject us and persecute us. That does not excuse those actions. What it does is it binds us even closer to those who came before us and those who will be reunited with in the new world. It binds us closer to our tradition as a faith and ultimately it brings us closer to our Lord himself who underwent every kind of suffering that we will possibly face. Abandoned by his friends, mocked and rejected, misunderstood, lied to, ignored, looked down upon, humiliated, but on the third day he rose again and gave us the path to eternal life. What binds us to our Lord is not simply his teachings, but the fact that he lived as a man, and that everything you will suffer in your life and every challenge you will ever face, he faced, from physical illness to the death of a loved one, to being rejected, to being mocked, to facing death. He faced everything you face. And that's why he is a God that understands us, because he was us, because he made us, and he created us to be with him again. And it is in the way we live this faith now, and in particularly in the persecuted church, where the example of Christ shines through the greatest. And so even though we seek to fight against persecution, we also look to it as an opportunity to be an example to the world. Because today we gather here in the comfort and the security and the shadows of the White House and the Capitol, and perhaps because of it, believe that simply giving speeches and being complacent about the status quo is an option. It is not. We must move on this with a sense of urgency. We must stand with our persecuted brothers and sisters in their hour of suffering. I know that we will. I end with this verse that I think is timely today. It's from the Sermon on the Mount. I tried to tweet it this morning, but it, I don't know if the characters fit. I couldn't get it to... I don't know how you do that double tweet to 280, so I'll work on it. But here's... Uh, here's it's from the 10th through the 12th verse of chapter 5 in Matthew, and it says, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Those words are appropriate today, and they've been appropriate every day for over 2,000 years. So I thank you again for inviting me, and I look forward to continuing to work with you on this and many other causes. May God bless all of you. Thank you. Profound gratefulness and respect and admiration, Senator, we offer you this expression of our gratitude to Senator Marco Rubio for his extraordinary commitment to religious freedom and for his advocacy for the Christians of the Holy Lands and Middle East, Washington, D.C. Senator.
Wasn't that inspiring? <laughs> Senator Rubio, you're a man of faith and inspiration. Your Eminence, Archbishop Demetrius, Exarch of Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew. Your Eminences and Excellencies, thank you again, Senator Rubio. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Brother Archon Michael, who was so instrumental in inviting Senator Rubio here to address us. We thank him again. Brother Archons, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Order of St. Andrew, Archons of the Ecumenical Patriarchate, I welcome you all this morning. Yesterday was a powerful and inspirational day, a day with dialogue and conversations and the presence of our government leaders truly a hopeful sign for the work of this third international conference on religious freedom. Please allow me to express on behalf of the Archons our abiding gratitude and appreciation for your presence in these most urgent conversations on the fate of Christianity in the lands of its birth and growth. We all see the dangers encroaching on historic and ancient communities throughout the region. The most recent violence against Sufi Muslims in North Sinai in the attack on a ma mosque that left nearly 400 dead. As we know so well, Sinai is the home of mo the monastery of St. Catherine the world's oldest institution with a continuous history in one place. The violence within the Muslim world between differing traditions, whether they be Sunni, Shia, Sufi, Alawi, Druze, or any other, demonstrates that the danger is not only against the Christians and the Jews, but to Muslims themselves. Violence and persecution of one eventually leads to violence and persecution of all. Allow me to repeat what was said yesterday by His Eminence Archbishop Angelos during the powerful testimony of our panelists who quoted the words of the prominent German Protestant pastor Martin Niemöller who spent seven years of his life in a Nazi concentration camp for his anti-Nazi activities in Germany. And I quote, first they came for the socialists and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists and I did not speak out because I, was a not, because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. My friends, we must speak out for those who suffer this bane of religious hatred and persecution. Thank you all, and especially our senator who just left. God bless, and at this point, I invite to the podium to offer words of gratitude Archbishop Angelus.
Your Eminences, sisters and brothers, good morning. I promise not to take any more of your time. You were very kind to put up with me yesterday. But uh, this uh, regrettably will be my last session with you because I fly back to London. I've come especially for this and I'm flying back. But I didn't want to go without saying thank you. Thank you for your vision. Thank you for your faithfulness, for your dedication. Thank you for being those who remember the other parts of the body that suffer. Because it is our collective witness that will enable us to continue to witness for others. And it is the best projection of our Christianity that we continue to be light in an increasing darkness, but a darkness that will never overcome. And just um, as a very small uh, token of thanks, I, I would like to express my thanks to His Eminence Archbishop Dimitrios for hospitality, for the graciousness, for your leadership with this group who are definitely loving children of yours and his, of His All Holiness, the Patriarch. And it is wonderful to see this commitment because uh, sometimes we think that communities in diaspora tend to become disjointed. Well, I wish people could be here now to see exactly how not disjointed they are and how committed they are to their roots. Not only the roots that have brought them this far, but a commitment to a further journey fully engaged in the life of this nation. Yemenins, if you will allow me, I'd like to offer a small icon as a gift. Could I also at this stage, and he has no idea this is happening because I tricked him into thinking there were only three icons being presented, but Father Alexander, if you could come up, please. National Commander, uh, Dr. Limbrakis. Thank you so much. Thank you so very much. And finally, to uh, someone who's become a friend, and uh, I'm not sure if he's in the room, uh, Mike Manatos is the chair of the conference. Well, well, I think we always know that good fruits only come from good trees. So could we invite the tree to come up, please? Once again, thank you for your graciousness and thank you for your welcome. I pray that God continues to bless this work and um, that we continue our journey together. For those who have suffered persecution and who those, as we heard from the senator, because of who we are, will continue to suffer persecution, but we also know the gates of Hades shall never prevail. Thank you.